I believe the body is incredible. We just got to do our part and remove the interference. Welcome to the stage, Nicholas Bailey. How do I start the tribe? What can I do? What's the next thing I can do? Most unselfish thing a person could do is expand. No other option besides hard work. How they can live this three-dimensional lifestyle. Hello and welcome back to the Billion Dollar Brotherhood show. Could ketogenic diet specifically help you lose belly fat, increase testosterone, massive energy changes? I don't know. You have to stick to the very end of the show to be able to figure it out. Yet if you're brand new here, make sure to hit that subscribe button, ring that bell. We talk about everything when it comes to health, relationships, and business when it comes to the businessman specifically, because those are the things that we cannot outsource and we all go through every single day. And the commonality is that we all run businesses here because these are the three areas that we cannot outsource as businessmen or get away from is health, wealth, and relationships. And the commonality between all of us is that we all run businesses. And today's episode addresses that health category in a way that's brand new and from an expert. I'm so excited about it. Actually, he wrote a book, a best-selling book called Keto Flex. He has over 120,000 subscribers on YouTube, over five million downloads on his top 15 podcast. Welcome, my friend and ketogenic expert, Ben Azadi. Ben, welcome to the BDB podcast, man. Nicholas, I'm excited to be here, brother. Heck yeah, dude. Congrats, by the way. I see that plaque behind you with the YouTube logo. I'm, I'm looking for that. You know, Secretly, I'm like, dude, I need to get you on the show so I can learn more about how to grow our YouTube. Uh, but also in general, I love what you've done. Uh, we've had a mutual friend, Andrew Hall, that's known about you. And he actually told us about you back when you were maybe at 10,000 subscribers, now past 100,000 subscribers, and, and obviously lots of other things that you've done as well. But it just is a cool thing that I want to honor first. Because people think that, oh, people could just go out. The building a following doesn't mean that you make money, right? These business people out there. Like, well, building a following means that you're saying something that matters to people and they're gathering around it like a campfire in the cold, like a solution, a community, and really cool things. So I want to honor you for that and, and the, obviously the mission that you're on. And I just think it's really, really cool. So thank you for being here, first off, honoring you for that. And I know that one thing that I would love to know is that there's so many different diets and stuff out there. Obviously, we got keto like plastered on the YouTube video if you're watching on the video version. In the background, also with Keto Flex, a book right there, best-selling author. What made you get into that like through everything else? Did you go through a process like of other different diets and methodologies? Was it an issue that you went through? Did you try other things beforehand? Kind of give me that backstory. Yeah, and thank you for the acknowledgement. I received that uh, very well. Appreciate that, Nicholas. And yeah, shout out to Andrew Hall. Love that guy. So for me, it's I got my start in the health journey back in 2008 when I went through my own transformation. I lost 80 pounds. I was physically obese, mentally obese, and I lost 80 pounds of fat. And I really just transformed my health, transformed my life. And that's what got me started in the space. But I wanted to figure out health at the cellular level. So I did other protocols. I was a vegan for a year and a half. That didn't work too well for me. But then I discovered in 2013, this ancient Wait, healing so you were you were a vegan for a year and a half. I was. And you, I'm assuming you read something or got educated on something and you felt like at that time that that was like the end all be all solution, or at least you tried it out right in the middle of that story. Just go touch on that. Cause this was a pretty big fad for a little while. Right. And maybe for some people that is their fad. Correct. What was the, what, what made you do that? And then how'd you feel after the year and a half just for people that are interested or tried it themselves? So yeah, I was reading books back then because I wanted to feel better, although I was fit. I was one of those fit, sick people, so I didn't feel that healthy. So I read a book called The China Study, which a lot of people who go vegan, it's because of that book. <laughs> and I read it not really understanding how to read and research studies. So I kind of got duped by the book. Um, it's really poorly researched, but well-written, if that makes sense. So it, it fooled me. So I went all in to this vegan approach. I was very dogmatic about it. <laughs> Nicholas told all my friends and all my family members about it. And you know, in the beginning, I felt better first 60 days or so. But then every month, my health would start to decline. But I trapped myself on this box. But after a year and a half, I said, you know what? My hormones feel wonky. I don't have great energy levels. I'm struggling at the gym. I want to do some lab work to verify that. And it did. And it showed that things were off. So I decided to actually get away from it. That's what got me inspired to I've get heard into this, it. right? Like there's, yeah. there's some people that love the vegan diet. And I'm, I'm sure that maybe you go into in your book or some of your other content that maybe some things work for some people, even some foods based on where you're born in your life or blood types, et cetera, yeah. sometimes do better because you 
process that food for hundreds or multiple generations or whatever. Um, but I've heard this before that maybe it does work for some, but I've heard for some people, they have an increasing, a decline in their health over time. And a lot of the examples are influencers. People make fun of, this is the representation of vegan. And this is the representation of, let's say carnivore, which mm -hmm. is all meat. And like the, the way that they look is if you were to pick it off that you're like, Oh, I want to eat the carnivore then. Um, have right. you heard of this as well? I've heard like declining health over 10 years. I've heard even people say crazy things like vegans die in a decade or something like that. And that's like, Oh my gosh, I yeah. don't know. Kind of bring me through that. Totally. I mean, here's the deal. There's not one diet that works long-term. It's the magic is in the variation and, and what I call keto flexing, right? So I love the vegan diet short term. I think it has numerous benefits, especially if you're transitioning away from a standard American diet, you'll get benefits. But the problem is that people stick with it too long. So like you just said, to your point, yes, you're going to end up starving your brain and starting your hormones, starving your hormones when you're in vegan too much because we need cholesterol from animal products to build our hormones, to build vitamin D, to build the brain. And depending on your genetics, it'll take a certain amount of time before those benefits start to diminish and you start to really hurt your health. Somebody might get that in six months and they feel bad. Somebody might be six years, but your genetics play a role there. I think veganism long-term is a, a bad idea. And are, are you pro vegetables? I've also had some friends that are like, vegetables are bitter because you're not supposed to eat them. They don't reproduce through being eaten. And so you should stick to more like tubers or, or potatoes if you're going to have something like that. Or obviously meat products, depending on what the animal ate, it determines the nutrients inside the actual meat and whatever you're eating from the animal. So are you someone that's like, oh, I still eat like lots of vegetables and kale and all this stuff? Or are you trying to get most of your nutrients through other sources as well? Both, right? I, I think vegetables could be great. Even if it has these what's called anti-nutrients plant toxins, it could create a, a hormetic stressor, which is a good stress, but then have too much of it, you have a decline. So I love carnivore, right? I, in my book, Keto Flex, I have an entire chapter on carnivore, but the way that I oh. teach it and personally follow it is short term. So the, the, the answer is not to just eliminate the vegetables altogether. The answer is to eliminate it short term, fix the gut, bring them back in. So I love those vegetables, but I don't have them every single day. I have them some days and some days I don't have them. Got it. So for the people listening as well, one of the benefits of this, including my business topic leaders and my relationship leaders is mostly so that you don't have to go through the same journey, but you're going to go through the journey right now with us so that you can come to some of your own conclusions without having to go through the years of process or the tens of thousands of dollars of investment, whether it's in business or it's in health. You started out, you hit this vegan diet because of a book that you read and then you moved on to something else, take your story from there back back to where you were at. Yeah, and that's a great point because when you do and listen to podcasts like this one, you take decades of learning and turn that into days, right? You have conversations like this. So I love podcasts like this. So for me, I decided after a year and a half to finally get away from the vegan diet. And I, I started to research health at the cellular level and I came across ketosis. And what I came across was fascinating, Nicholas, because I, I, I came across the fact that the, every single one of our ancestors did keto. That's why keto technically is not a diet. It's a metabolic process. So every one of our ancestors did keto because their environment forced them into ketosis, but then they got out of it whenever they had carbohydrates available. So I decided to give keto a shot, pair it with intermittent fasting, and oh my gosh, it turned my brain on. Of course, I dropped fat, I reduced inflammation, I performed better at the gym, my sleep got better, my hormones got better, and I really just saw the light when it comes to true health. And that was back in 2013. Ever since then, I've been doing different variations of it. I made a lot of mistakes with it. I've been doing it and teaching it for seven years now. I think it's a great tool if you apply it the right way. So go back a little bit for the people that aren't very familiar with keto, our ancestors were in ketosis, and what that exactly is and how you reach it. Can you define it for us and kind of break down exactly what that is? For sure. So the reason every single one of our ancestors did keto is because they went through periods of time where they didn't have food available to them. They didn't have the luxury of like Uber Eats and DoorDash or whatever it was, whatever it is that we have this day. So they went days, sometimes weeks, sometimes months without food. And if you're not eating food, your body needs to survive. So it starts to break down fat and your liver then produces ketones. Burning ketones and burning fat is our birthright. For example, babies, right? You have a new baby, beautiful baby. Babies yep. that are breastfed actually go in and out of ketosis because breast milk has saturated fat and cholesterol, which actually helps the development of the brain. 
So we love to burn fat. Burning fat is our primal birthright. So what exactly is keto? Well, when we look at the body, inside the body, there's 70 trillion cells. Out of those 70 trillion cells, we only have two options for fuel. Either the body and the cells are burning glucose in the form of sugar, or it's burning fat and producing ketones. When I was obese, I was a sugar burner. If you're an entrepreneur and you're a sugar burner, it's going to be very difficult to be productive because you're going to have to eat every two to three hours. You're going to have to have snacks nearby and you're going to need a hit of glucose just to function. So we don't like that. I compare burning glucose at the cellular level to a truck that's speeding through the streets with all this smoke being blasted out of the exhaust pipe of this truck. That truck is not going to be healthy for the surrounding environment. Picture all this smoke just being blasted out, going on other cars, dirtying the road, uh, going all over the trees. That's going to be very toxic to the environment. That's what's happening at your cells when it's stuck as a sugar burner. When you could teach your cells to switch to fat and producing ketones, that's like a Tesla cruising through your streets, much cleaner source for the surrounding environment much cleaner source for your cellular environment. So what we wanna do is teach the body to burn fat and produce ketones. When you do that, ketones cross what's called the blood-brain barrier and go right into the brain and gives you an immediately hit of, uh, immediate hit of energy. So mental clarity, focus, you're energized, you're productive, and you're in a state of what I call the great land of ketosis. So that's what I wanna teach your audience to do. That's awesome. So you went on this journey around 2013 Obviously, there's lots of people that are like, man, I, I've seen this documentary, I've heard of keto, I've heard of carnivore, I've heard of whatever it is. I'm sure that you've gone through that as well. Like you're not someone who just has his blinders on, not learning about anything new, or else you would have been still doing the vegan diet, or you still would have been just a guy living off sugar because you would have never been open to anything new. So throughout that process, kind of take me through some of the other options that you've seen out there that you've seen are fads that you believe keto maybe does better for people that they could try out and then we can get into some of the benefits and how they can actually do it and maybe some things that we could try leaving here. Yeah, there's so much information out there. You do a quick search on Dr. Google for even like what is the keto diet? You'll get over 100 million results. Not all keto diets are created equal. A lot of the times people do keto the wrong way. They eat the wrong fats. They actually create more inflammation in their body. So everything that I teach when it comes to keto is from a cellular lens. It's, to, it's to, for the goal of reducing inflammation around your cells. And when you do that, now your hormones could do a better job, the nutrients could get into your cells, and you just feel better, and you live a long, healthy life, which is the goal here. So when it comes to fads, keto could be a fad if you look at it for just weight loss and you follow the wrong protocol. But when you look at it the way that I teach it, it's more of a lifestyle. So veganism could be a fad, paleo could be a fad, carnivore could be a fad. If you approach it from that viewpoint of, I just want to lose weight, I want to just eat whatever foods that are approved in this diet. But what I want your audience to consider is focus on health, not weight loss. Focus on reducing inflammation. And as you do that, you're going to feel so much better. And I know there's a lot of documentaries out there. There's a lot of uh, books and podcasts out there. It's a lot of conflicting information. The only way to know if it's going to work for you is to do it. Do it. See how you feel. Get some lab work done. Get the lab work done again in six months. Do you see improvements? Do you feel better? That's your answer right there. And that's what I had to discover along the way is just to do it myself. Look at lab work. And of course, you could look at the research and all that if you want to take the time to do that. But the bottom line is to do it and see how you feel. And would you say that this works for people that want to be athletic, not just live a long time, but they want to crush it in their sport or obviously be shredded, have a six pack, all those different things. Would this be a good route for them? And is there any examples of other people out there that are using this method that are shredded that maybe people would know? Yeah, absolutely. So ketones specifically are muscle sparing. So they preserve your muscle. And if you actually could pair that up with fasting, fasting actually raises human growth hormone, which is muscle building. So it can be done. You would want to do more of a calorie surplus and have more healthier fats and protein. So Robert Sykes is a gentleman you can go check out. He's been on my Keto Camp podcast. He's a keto bodybuilder, natural bodybuilder. Danny Vega, another um, massive man who's been doing keto carnival for years. And there's countless others out there. So yes, it can be done. The goal is health. And when you are healthier, you're going to perform better. And so bring me through the laws because I see people out there that are, they may hear their friends are doing keto and they, so they get it through the grapevine and then they're maybe eating too many carbohydrates or I've even heard people eating too much protein because true keto isn't a crazy amount of protein from what I've heard. 
So bring me through the framework. For me, I always look at what are the things in business or in whatever I'm doing that I absolutely need to be successful? And in business, we have things like lead generation, lead nurturing, sales process, an actual product, and a way to be able to keep clients and sell them more things. Those are needed, right? Finance, you need to do your taxes. So it's like, without that, you're not going to be successful. What are some of the parameters of this is what you need to be able to be keto, like maybe what you should eat. And then we'll talk about good keto because you just talked about there's bad ways to do it. Yeah. What the heck do I need to do to be like, I'm doing the keto lifestyle. We'll call it diet for fun <laughs> to try it out. Right. Cause it should be new. It's something that I haven't done before. I haven't done keto personally. I have friends that love it, but sometimes you care from the grapevine. So what's the container? What is keto on the basis level? What do you need to do? And then tell me how to do it right. Good way. So in my book, uh, Keto Flex, I have a, a four pillar, a four pillar framework to achieving long-term results with keto and fasting. The first pillar is called adapt, getting your body to adapt to burning fat instead of sugar. How do you do that? You want to track your total carbohydrates and drop your total carbs to below 50 grams for the day. Very simple to do. Just get an app on your phone, track it. At the same time, you want to increase your healthy fats. There's a protocol in my book called the 2222 rule. And if you're going to do keto, you want to start with this 222 rule uh, immediately, which is every single day you're, you're going to consume two tablespoons of coconut oil or MCT oil, two tablespoons of olive oil or avocado oil, two tablespoons of grass-fed butter or grass-fed ghee. And that final two is two teaspoons of sea salt for the electrolytes. So you want to increase your healthy fats, decrease your carbs. And in the beginning, yeah, you have moderate to low protein. And then later on, you do increase the protein. So those are the healthy so, fats. Yeah. So 50 grams of carbs or less, which is easy. It's pretty easy. You can like, you know, Google, like you can Google what's the, how many carbs are in this banana that I'm eating or exactly. in a cup of whatever. And then you said two tablespoons of butter or ghee, olive oil, coconut oil. And then what was the last one? Uh, olive oil, avocado oil, coconut oil, MCT oil, butter, ghee, and then sea salt. And you want all of those two tablespoons of each one of those? Uh, no, either or. So either avocado okay. oil or olive oil. Yeah, I mean, that's a lot of fat. <laughs> yeah, you're going to be going to the bathroom, Nicholas. Yeah, that's too much. Yeah. But that's cool. throughout the whole day, right? With all your meals, not just in one sitting. So each meal that you eat, you have two tablespoons of e any of these very, of, of these building blocks that you have. Yeah. And for the entire day, you want to hit those, those, th those numbers. It's not just for one meal, but yeah. And how food. much is in your entire day do you have? You, you're going to have uh, two tablespoons of each, right? Either two tablespoons of olive oil or avocado oil, two tablespoons of coconut oil or MCT oil, and then butter or ghee and then sea salt. Perfect. And the, t the sea salt was two teaspoons, you said? Yeah, yeah. Teaspoons, not tablespoons. Yeah. It's a lot of salt. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so th at the end of the day, that'll be like six tablespoons, I believe it was. Yes. I just wrote it down. I was taking notes. Like people wonder why I'm looking down. I love it. Like, cool. Um, so that's, that's the starting point. And then, you, and then go keep going. What were you saying about protein? And then protein, yeah, you keep it moderate to low in the beginning. After 14 days, I actually like to increase the protein because it helps, helps you feel full, especially animal. So how do, you, how do you eat this then? You just like scoop it down, like just throw down like thing of butter, fats? like take a bite? Of the fats or the protein? Well, you said keep the protein low. Am I throwing all this like on a little bit of protein? Like if you were to give us a grams of protein a day, so we kind of like, I'm very big on precise, right? I'm like, if I get a gym program, I'm like, but you didn't tell me how much I'm supposed to rest in between each activity. I'm like freaking out, right? Because I'm like, changes everything. I need to know the variables. Um, so you said a little bit lower protein, but something sustainable. What, what would be an amount that wouldn't hurt me if I had this much protein a day? You want to get about eight ounces of animal-based protein at each meal. Um, so eight to 10 ounces. That's a lot. Like a pound, that's like a pound a day if I had those three different meals, right? Yeah. And the reason I like protein is because it helps you feel full and satisfied and it helps this become more sustainable than uh, a person falling off track. It activates different hormones like cholecystokinine and leptin and other ones that help you feel full. That's why I do like protein. And it's not going to necessarily kick you out of ketosis. Um, and do so, you usually have three meals then a day and you have like the two tablespoons in each one of them? And obviously you do like the fasting stuff as well. So you outside of your fast, you have in three meals, eight ounces of protein in each one. 
throwing on two tablespoons of butter and making it freaking taste amazing or, <laughs> or whatever it is that you're using. Is that typically what you do? Well, this protocol is for somebody who's new to keto. It's the first 14 days. After that, Perfect. you can start to taper down the fat, let your body tap into its own fat stores. So I don't follow that protocol, but if I was starting now, I would follow that protocol. Perfect. So let's say after the 14 days, because I'm someone who's always like, I'm the guy who's, instead of working, I, I look at the professional athlete and I'm like, I just want to start doing his workouts and his regiment today. I'm like, I don't really want to work up to these things, right? And I get that you're supposed to, but for someone who just is like, all right, I'm committing to this for a year or whatever the heck I need to do, what, what's like your sustainable? Because I think when people think about this, they go, well, I don't want to eat too much fat because what if I get fat? Because that's what I've been told my whole life. Mm. And even if they get told differently, like even in my mind, I was 60 pounds overweight. I'm like, I don't want to freaking overeat things. Just give me like what I need to do after the 14 days so I can do this thing. So clear that up and then also give me after the 14 days, what's kind of the protocol. Yeah. So after the 14 days, then you're going to prioritize protein. You're going to have the 40 to 50 grams of animal-based protein at each meal, eight to 10 ounces. For fat, you're just going to have enough fat so that you're satisfied. So you start to taper down the fat, prioritize the protein, just have enough natural fat with that protein. And then for the carbs, you're still going to keep that below 50 grams each day. And because it's a big difference on how many meals we have, maybe someone has one meal. I'm someone who can easily forget to eat meals. Like today, I haven't really eaten anything since I had something with my wife after we went to the gym. And I'll, I can forget and I just won't eat anything. And then I end up not having enough food. How many meals would you recommend a day that we have those eight to 10 ounces? Is it the three meals that we had them in a day? And obviously we could have two meals probably that are the same amount as three of them. Would that hit the amounts that you're looking for? Yeah, so it'll depend. If somebody's really overweight, they could get away with just doing one meal like that, right? Because then they could just allow their body to burn the body fat. They have extra body fat stores. Somebody who's leaner like you, Two meals would suffice, a six hour eating window with two of those meals and then an 18 hour fasting window. That's what I personally do. I like a 18, six schedule with two meals in the eating window. Cool. And, and like you said, eight to 10 ounces, which is a lot more than I thought. I thought that like you had to eat 30 grams of protein or 5% of your, of your calories and protein mm -hmm. and then have all this like, you know, pile 15 avocados on top of it. But don't avocados have carbohydrates as well? They have some. Like yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So this is like that, that next phase, right? So, uh, some of the best proteins for people, if they were to walk away from here, they're like, all right, I got the two tablespoons, two tablespoons, two tablespoons, two teaspoons of salt, which you could throw those in your meal, right? Correct. With, exactly. With salt. Okay. Yeah. So we can make it taste good. You don't have to like <laughs> yeah. chuck it in a little bit of water and like gargle that thing and swallow it. And then best types of protein, if we were to do this, are you, do you not care about the fat content since you're having fat? Or yeah. what, so, what, are we, what are you looking for? Uh, so you want to get uh, the fat should come naturally in that protein. So grass-fed beef, terrific. Grass-fed lamb, eggs with the yolk are terrific. Uh, I also like uh, like free-range chicken or some wild-caught seafood. That's also a good thing. And in, in terms of like protein powders, if you want to use a protein powder, I like collagen protein powder from a grass-fed, cold-pressed uh, collagen protein source. That's cool, man. So then when it comes to performance moving here, like one of the things that we talked about is, um, is getting the quality, right? So on, on top of it, you talked about like the different things that you're doing with the, the oils. I didn't hear anything about like fats that are not oil or can be like broken down into kind of liquids. There might be some guys out there that are like, what about like nut butters? And what about things like that aren't solid, like other avocados and stuff like that? Are you mixing those things in as well? Yeah, those are fine. So in my, I, I could give your audience a free resource. I have a, what's called my keto camp blueprint where I had, it's an aisle by aisle grocery shopping list. I just tell you, look, eat these foods. Don't eat these foods. It keeps it really basic. So it's called keto camp blueprint.com, but you could have the nut butters. You want to make sure it's organic. But what I really want to touch upon real quick, Nicholas, is like what fats to avoid because a lot of people do keto and they do it the wrong way. So can I get into that? Totally. Let's get it. So a lot of people who are doing keto are eating these bad inflammatory fats. And uh, these are worse than sugar because your body can't use them as a fuel source and it creates a massive amounts of inflammation leading to disease. And I interviewed two people last year on my Keto Camp podcast, a gentleman named Brian Peskin, MIT researcher, 
and then Dr. Kate Shanahan, who was the nutritionist for the Los Angeles Lakers when Kobe Bryant was there. And they're both brilliant minds. And we were talking about these bad fats on keto. According to their research, um, I'm going to compare smoking cigarettes to these bad fats. According to their research, a person who smokes two packs of cigarettes every single day for 28 years, their chances of developing lung cancer within those 28 years is 16%, one six. Now compare that to somebody who eats these bad fats, and I'll give your audience an entire list, but these bad fats every single day for 28 years, their chances of developing cancer or heart disease is 86%. Because these fats, they gunk up your cells and they create inflammation for six to 12 months. They're rancid, the body can't use them for fuel. Your body could burn sugar, cannot burn these fats. So if there's one tip your audience is gonna take action on during this conversation, please let it be this one right here. We wanna avoid the following fats. Canola oil, corn oil, soybean oil, cottonseed oil, sunflower oil, safflower oil, rice bran oil, and peanut oil. Those are the toxic eight right there. Avoid them as much as possible. And these are found in even like solid food that you buy from the store. So if people are thinking, okay, cool, I just won't get these oils. Or if you go eat out, these are things I've seen before, right? At like restaurants, they use them all the time. Mm -hmm. On top of that, if I looked at, let's say they got a veggie patty, right? They're thinking, oh my gosh, veggie patty, veggie burger. I've seen this, like the like one of the first top five ingredients will be this soybean oil or canola oil. Canola oil is like the top one, especially dressings, dude. Mm -hmm. I'm mean, looking at these dressings. Look at the back of your dressings. Freaking everything. There's not har hardly any dressings unless they promote it because they know it's like badass. If they're like, we use olive oil. Right. And then cold pressed olive oil, like one step further. And so like, where are the places that they see these mostly that they need to like keep their eye out where it's not just, you know, buying vegetable oil off the rack? Where else are they seeing these in the foods? Yeah, you said it. It's ubiquitous. It's all over Whole Foods. Like if you're getting the hot food bar at Whole Foods, it's loaded there. It's loaded in salad dressings and ketchups. Even some salad dressings or mayonnaise, say, with olive oil, but it still has canola oil. It's like ridiculous. There, it's You have to read the ingredients. And, and when you go to restaurants, I know it's a pain in the ass, but when you go to restaurants, you got to ask the waiter or waitress what they used to cook with. And it's going to be soybean. It's going to be canola. It's going to be a bad fat. So what I do, and this drives my girlfriend nuts, I tell them that, hey, everybody at this table is allergic to those oils. Can you use an olive oil or a butter? And usually it's fine. They, they do that. But you have to say you're allergic. So they treat you seriously. But especially if you have kids, right? You got to look at the foods they're eating as well that you're feeding them. So do an audit on your own kitchen first. And then now that you're aware, you can start making better choices. You know the fats you should have and the fats you should avoid. So let's say people are eating traditionally healthy because I'm sure there's some people that are listening that I've had people reach out to me back but when I owned my first health company and they used to say, well, you know, I, I exercise like four or five days a week and I do X, Y, Z. And I'm like, well, I don't get it. Like, what's your problem then? And then I find out that they actually did it one week and like they had a good week like last week where they did these things and then they end up falling off and all, all that stuff. So let's say that traditionally, they kind of people generally know that they should eat healthier, exercise, drink more water, sleep better, not smoke cigarettes, not eat sugar. They know it here, but oftentimes in action, it's a little bit more difficult. Let's say that they are eating pretty healthy. Stand, they think, oh, I'm ordering a few salads, eating some lean proteins, you know, which obviously goes against what you just said, but the typical healthy. And they're hitting the gym every once in a while what is the difference? Like they're eating maybe some of the canola oils. They aren't in ketosis. They maybe aren't getting sufficient proteins. They're eating too much sugar every once in a while. What's the biggest differences that they're going to experience if they were to go all in, try the 14 days, and then maybe get your book and go through some of the other stuff after the 14 days? What's the biggest differences that they're going to experience that may be motivating to start? The biggest one is they're going to achieve metabolic freedom. Okay, they're going to allow their body to be able to burn its own body fat stores. And the, yeah, that, that'll benefit you in terms of weight loss. But more importantly, it's going to benefit you because it's going to eliminate distractions. It's going to eliminate the need to have a snack all the time. So it'll turn your brain right on. It take, you're, you're going to be able to go like, like Nicholas just did today and exercise and just be in a fasted state and do your interview and do your podcast, whatever it is, and be at a peak state because your body is has achieved metabolic freedom. That's the goal. Um, it takes massive amounts of energy and resources to process food and digest food. 
I heard it's like the second biggest, right? Second biggest energy taker or user is digestion. I don't know if yeah, that's yeah, it is. And, and it's 14 to 16 hours to process one meal, dude. 14 to 16 hours. So it takes blood flow from the brain, blood flow away from the brain to the stomach. It takes all these resources and it starts directing it to digestion. So when you don't have to do that and eat all the time, now you have all this energy to be used to crush your day. I've never heard about it with the blood flow being used for something else rather than your brain and taking nutrients. That's interesting. Yeah. Oh, that's really good. Okay, keep going. Yeah, dude, massive amounts of energy, including that blood flow. So when you practice more of the protocols that I'm teaching here and do more intermittent fasting, ketosis, it'll turn your brain on. So you'll be more productive. You'll have more mental clarity. You're going to get better sleep. Your skin's going to improve. Yes, you'll lose some weight because as you get healthy, you lose weight, not the other way around. And you'll reduce inflammation. So you'll prevent disease. I mean, when we look out there, Nicholas, in just America, this a beautiful country we live in, one out of three women are diagnosed with cancer. One out of two men are diagnosed with cancer. 60% of Americans are diabetic or pre-diabetic. So yeah, I'm all for scaling up and crushing it with your business and impacting lives. But why do that if your health is declining? The person who has a billion dollars in their bank account but is unhealthy and hurting all the time would trade their life for somebody who's broke with peak health. Because what good is all that money, but you go on a vacation and you're hurting all the time, you got to take a nap. So what I'm saying is you focus on your health, you're going to be more productive and you're going to scale even faster. And you're going to be able to enjoy all that hard work you're putting into your business. I, I believe there was a quote out there that was something like the, the man with his health or like the person with their health has a million problems, but a man without his health has but one or something like that, or a wish. Wish. A man yeah. without with his health has like a million wishes. Correct. A man without his health has but one wish. Exactly. Or something like that. It's uh, which true. is yeah. But the we story, wait until sometimes it's terrible to find that out. I do and that's the problem because when you make these bad decisions by having vegetable oils, alcohol, whatever it is, it's not really an immediately an, an immediate effect. Yeah, you might not feel so good, but it's these accumulated disasters. So what I teach is take less hits. When you look at all the world-class athletes out there, Tom Brady, who just won another Super Bowl, Dwayne Wade, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, what do they all have in common? Towards the second half of their career, they took less hits and they extended their career. Same thing with us. We want to just take less hits. And right now we're taking so many hits, but they're small hits that eventually add up over time. Boom, you're diagnosed with the disease and you have six months to live. We don't want to get to that point. I believe the body is incredible. We just got to do our part and remove the interference. So you said something about alcohol. I remember meeting the owner of Dry Farm Wines. I don't know yeah. if you've heard of this. Yeah. And it's basically the, the farmers, for the people listening, don't water their grapes as much. And so because they don't water them as much or overwater them, they don't produce more water and more sugar. And then you can actually stay in ketosis while drinking wine a whole bottle or something at night or something like that. Yeah. You said something about alcohol. Are, is there things even with alcohol to stay away from? Because you could drink, alcohol doesn't have as many carbs, right? Because they're kind of, broken down the, all the calories don't count up to all the carbs so you could have 250 calories of alcohol may only be a few carbs which mm -hmm. means we could drink quite a bit of alcohol if we don't know more about this certain alcohols that do's and don'ts with alcohol yeah absolutely and, and yeah i like dry farm wines you were referring to todd awesome guy and uh, they make a great uh gmo free no pesticides no herbicides keto friendly wine called dry farm wine so that could be a good option now in general when we talk about alcohol, we want to avoid wine as much as possible with the exception of dry farm wines, because most wines have herbicides and pesticides in it. The average California wine has 64 herbicides and pesticides in it, which is absurd. Have, dude. have you heard of these biodynamic places, though? Yeah, the, that's the a dry farm wine right that. now. It's like it takes years to like these people take over 10 years bringing in insects and like prey and predators and all these things to build an ecosystem where they don't have to use these pesticides and right. herbicides. It's crazy that I'll have to, I'll put in the show notes below a company that we use that's in California. They, they, they've been biodynamic for like 13 years. It took them and we've been ordering their stuff because my wife can't even drink the other stuff mm -hmm. because it gives her a massive headache every single time. Yep. It's, it's insane. So keep going. All these pesticides, herbicides, Stay away from all these regular cheap wines that aren't doing a good job. Look for the dry form wines or maybe biodynamic if you think that that's good. 
Yeah, biodynamic is great. I I think dry farm wines is also bi biodynamic. So yeah, if you could find a good biodynamic source like the one you mentioned, terrific. But in general, avoid the wines because of that issue. Beer also we want to avoid. Beer is very estrogenic. So for men, it's going to create some man boobs because when estrogen goes up, testosterone goes down. So your sex drive, your libido goes down. Not good. So what should we drink if we you know had to choose? Um, I would recommend more of like the tequila and vodka, maybe like triple distilled vodka or tequila. The, the body's going to be able to handle that much better than the other options out there and have it with just like on the rocks. That's the best way to do it. So you said something about estrogen. I know that I've read that testosterone in high today is low of 100 years ago. Men are experiencing more uh, estrogen. And obviously there's a lot of different things out there that they could read up on about plastics and mm -hmm and different bad products with chemicals and stuff like that. But let's say someone had higher estrogen, they felt like they had higher estrogen. What are some of the things that they could do to either reduce estrogen or have, because you said even estrogen kind of binds with testosterone, we can't really use it. So what would be a way to decrease estrogen to maybe even get more use out of their testosterone or raise their testosterone as well? Yeah, the issue is that when a lot of men are looking to increase their testosterone, which is fine if you do it the natural ways, but if you have high estrogen present at the same time, the testosterone that you're increasing is aromatizing and it's turning into estrogen. So you're not going to actually utilize the testosterone. And the reason is because, like you said, plastic. So the first thing, drink out of glass water bottles. I always have glass next to me. Make sure you're not eating, uh, drinking out of plastics. You're not microwaving plastic Tupperware. So avoid the plastics as much as possible. Um, make sure you're uh, avoiding toxins in general, like your cleaning products, your shampoos, your conditioners. I know it's not sexy to speak about, but yeah, if you could go as clean as possible and eliminate toxins, that'll drive down estrogen and raise testosterone uh, naturally. So that's what I would start with right there. And then also staying away from pesticides and herbicides, eating as organic and clean as much as possible, eating clean meats, because if you're eating corn-fed, grain-fed cows, what? They're pumped full of antibiotics, which is estrogenic when you eat that meat. So grass fed, grass finished is the way to go when it comes to your animal proteins. Ph phenomenal first off. And the next thing that I had is let's say someone tries this out and they are fatter. They like gain weight. They're like, Oh my gosh, what the heck do I do? If you, have you ever seen that happen one and two, what's the next step for them? Are they eating too much? You know, like what's the, what's the deal usually when you see that happen? Yeah, I, I would give it a good seven weeks before you even weigh yourself. Maybe you do it day one and then pay attention to non-scale victories. The reason is this. The weight will fluctuate for many reasons, like soreness from a workout. You worked out today, Nicholas. You're retaining a little bit more water. It'll show on the scale. If, and if you're adding exercise with your nutritional changes, muscle weighs more than fat as well. So I would give it a good seven weeks. Pay attention to non-scale victories. Get your body fat percentage done. Take some measurements. Take some photos. How do your clothes fit? After seven weeks, step on the scale. And if you see it not going anywhere, and maybe you gained a few pounds after seven weeks, then we have to revisit the fundamentals of health. Sleep and stress. Make sure you're getting at least seven hours of quality sleep. I know it's difficult for an entrepreneur to focus on sleep, but I'm telling you, if you do, not only will you burn fat, you're gonna be more productive. So revisit your sleep and master your stress. Take care of that. And then maybe you do need to scale down your fat and increase your protein and practice more fasting. Awesome, man. So Again, the, there's the 14 day challenge that people can do the 14 days, like kind of the kickstart. Mm -hmm. Where do they grab your book? You had a free offer as well that you talked about earlier. I want to make sure that we have these for people that are listening to the end. Where can they grab the book? So they go through some of that stuff. Where can they get this free template that you talked about as well? Um, and that way that they have everything to kind of get started and test this thing out. Yeah. Well, thanks for listening to the end or watching to the end if you're listening here. Um, well, you could get the book Keto Flex. It's going to be available April 12th worldwide on Amazon uh, over at awesome. ketoflexbook.com. 111 pages of keto gold. I'd love your support with that. It's really the best book out there on keto. It took me over two years to write. So I, I really hope your audience takes action with that. And then uh, if you want my free guide for what to buy on keto, grocery shopping, go to ketocampblueprint.com. Camp is spelled with a K, ketocampblueprint.com. Uh, and those are the resources for your audience. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much again for breaking down ketosis, breaking down uh, things like keto as a, not a diet, but a lifestyle. And I'm excited to see who takes action on this. If I have enough people that are like, oh, let's do this, maybe I'll just change everything up and make my wife do it with me as well. Mm. And we'll have to use a family keto. 
That's cool, um, man. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah, that, that'd be awesome, man. So thank you so much for sharing with the audience. Make sure to download that free guide. Make sure to pre-order or grab the book if it's already out. And that way that you could test out the keto journey for you so that you don't end up as statistic. Like he said, one out of three women are ending up with all these diseases, cancer, et cetera. Two, one out of two men, something like that. You said 60% are either diabetic or pre-diabetic state. Insane, which is not a great place to work at. I mean, even in the business world, that would mean that six out of 10 of these people are struggling in this area which means that you have an unfair advantage. And maybe if you don't have the same sales or the same marketing abilities, all these people, this might be something really amazing to give you that upper edge. Uh, dude, first off, thank you again. Second, we'll have to have you back talking about your YouTube channel, how you grew it, how you grew the audience, how you were consistent, how you stuck with one thing. I think it's really awesome. We'll definitely have to connect on that as well. I would love to. I love what you're doing, Nicholas. You're a huge inspiration, brother. Keep shining your light, man. And I'll be honored to come back on your show. Thanks, man. Appreciate it.